it made me re realize also when I met Kelly, it made me realize how lucky we are here in, uh, in the States. It's like if you really want something to happen, worst case scenario, you change states. Uh, in Europe, it's not quite that. And here she is. Okay, she's here. She's going to appear in a minute. We speak here. <laughs> it's so nice seeing you. Bonjour. Bonjour. <laughs> Bonsoir chez toi. <laughs> How are you? Really good. Really good. good. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm lucky I'm busy in my book, so I, uh, I can truly focus on something. And, but uh, yeah, otherwise, uh, all good. Trying to get ready to uh, get back into a new world when we go out, because it's yeah. not the same. <laughs> no, we have to build something new now. It's, uh, we have a wonderful opportunity, I think, to, to maybe build something new, though, from this. You know, like a phoenix. Yes, I think it's you know, <laughs> No, I, I'm lucky because I uh, I have spent months in solitary confinement on the, in tropical beaches or in the mountain of India. You know, right? where you don't have no connection whatsoever. We're lucky, right? Like I can I can talk to you. You're yeah. Down, and we have a bunch of people who can listen to your stories. Like it's pretty. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for the opportunity as well. It's wonderful. I'm, I've, I've been so excited all day. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, you have a pretty badass story. It's like as a, what a mother would do for her son, uh, you're a pretty good example of uh, there is no limit whatsoever. <laughs> And, uh, and the therapeutic aspect of, uh, of cannabis, we cannot call it a medicine because it mixes up too much the... Uh, the story with the big pharma, yep. but the power of that plant on uh, on cancer and like hardcore mm -hmm. uh, sickness that are destroying the humanity. It's pretty impressive. So, yeah, uh, everybody, this is Kali. She has an amazing story. I, uh, and her son is, I couldn't believe. When you see her son now, you don't believe her story. No. There's no way that kid went through it. No, I know, I know. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Um, I just, uh, for those that don't know, obviously I won't, um, I have written a book, so shameless plug, Frenchie, shameless plug. Uh, I will, it is everything, every single word is in here. Um, but um, yeah, it was it was 10 years ago nearly that Darren was first diagnosed with leukemia when he was just 10 years old. And then two years later, whilst on active chemotherapy, he was diagnosed with another cancer called Langerhan cell sarcoma. It made him the only person in the entire world because um, there was only 50 cases of Langerhan cell sarcoma ever recorded. And at that time, there was only five people in the entire world that had that cancer. And Darren was the only one to have two together. So they had no idea what to do with him. Um, he'd already been through a year, a year and a half of, of chemotherapy. And so they decided that a bone marrow transplant was the way to go to hopefully stop either cancer coming back. Um, the leukemia was got rid of with conventional treatment and the Langerhans cell sarcoma was cut out of his throat. So it was conventional treatment to start with. But then things just went downhill, massively downhill, infection after infection within the bone marrow transplant unit. And so isolation, <clears throat> I know what isolation is like, you know, two years Darren spent in a room by himself where nobody, none of his family members could go in other than me and his dad and the doctors and nurses. So um, you know, I, I, fully, uh, I fully understand how scary it is for people right now who are looking after somebody vulnerable and who are scared of somebody who coughs near them. I, I understand that fear greatly. I was terrified that I would take something into him. Um, and so unfortunately, he had four bone marrow transplants in 10 months. And the last one failed. So they told us. Now, three days after his final transplant, he trapped his fingers down the side of the bed and picked up two catastrophic infections in his hands and he had one in his mouth. Now they told us that nobody has ever engrafted after 50 days. If this bone marrow transplant does not kick in after 50 days, it is not gonna happen. There is no, no chance. 
So on day 46, which was approximately a week after Darren just had his 14th birthday, we were sent to a hospice where they told us there was nothing in there. There was no way it was going to work. And he was, that, that was it. He was going to die. And I said to them, you know, well, when we take him off, what I called the conscious life support, because Darren was very aware and they told us that antibiotics were the only things keeping him alive. I said to them, you know, well, when we take him off of this life support machine, how, how long are we talking? And he said, three days a week at most. When do you want to go? Um, I don't, <laughs> you know, how, how do you, how do you start that countdown to saying goodbye to your 14 year old son? You know, it's, um, it, it, it was a difficult time and he planned his own funeral. We, we sat down and we planned everything to the music, the hearse, the, the costumes, because it was fancy dress. He had an incredible sense of humor, the way he dealt with it. Um, and yeah, we, we planned everything and, but Darren didn't want to go anywhere and he became very, very anxious. And it was actually the anxiety more than anything that I was trying to help with, with the cannabis. So by the time it got to day 69 and he's still there, but he, by this point, his organs have started to shut down. Um, he's becoming very anxious. He's not dying quick enough as far as he's concerned. And um, he was having night terrors and all sorts of things. And his wake, his waking moments were just horrendous. He didn't want to be here. You know, I had the conversation with him about putting a pillow on his face. I, we we we'd done all of that you know um because he was so desperate and he didn't want to die on morphine and when when you go to a hospice if the child is old enough they fill in a a, a form with the doctor where they talk about what they want in ends of life and he said i i don't want to die on morphine he said they've taken everything else from me they're not taking my death i want to know everything that happens and i, I don't want to be you know off my face so as the morphine went up, I could see this wasn't what he wanted. And, and as his mother, all I could give him was his last dying wish. That's all I could do. And so I saw this tincture that I'd previously made um, to put in a vape pen, actually, but it hadn't worked. It wasn't strong enough. So I dismissed it. Um, so I gave him this tincture and within half an hour, I just saw, I just saw him completely relax. I saw everything just from top to bottom it was it was surreal um and then a nurse came to the door with a drug that he had become very addicted to called cyclozine and it's actually an anti-emetic but at the speed in which they administered it to him made him incredibly high and he enjoyed it and um so he was very addicted to that drug so when the nurse turned up at the door and i thought oh my god what have i done have i just caused some kind of contraindication i didn't know what was going to happen and i didn't need to worry because he turned to the nurse and said, I don't want it. You can, you can take it away. And I looked at her and she looked at me and I was like, just take it before he changes his mind. Because for nine months, there's no way he would have left that drug alone. So immediately it was an exit drug. Immediately. It got him off the cyclozine. It got him off the morphine. It got him off the lorazepam. It got him off everything that they had him on. And for five days, I just kept giving him this tincture. Now his hand, <laughs> um, with the, the the infections that he got in his hand, they were so bad that they wanted to amputate his hand because fentanyl wasn't working, morphine wasn't working, nothing would work. And they wanted to amputate the hands. And I said to them, don't amputate it, just sever the nerves if, if you have to, just sever the nerves so he can't feel it. And they said, well, that's very permanent. I said, well, so is an amputation, but you know, he's, he's dying. We just, we, we just want him pain free. So they did that, but they told me he'd never feel his hands again. He'd never use his hands again. And, and to us, that was absolutely fine. Now, so I started giving the tincture at day 70 after I'd had another test done on day 69, where they said there was absolutely nothing in there. Day 70, I started giving the tincture on day 75. He took his hands out from in between his legs. He'd fallen asleep. And one of the bandages came off. And now the doctors had told us under no uncertain terms, you do not take those bandages off because underneath is disgusting and it's open to infection and it's, you know. So when he held his hand up and I saw just the normal pink finger, I was like, well, I, I don't understand what are you showing me, Darren? And he's like, look at my finger, you know? And I was like, oh my God, the bandage had come off and his finger was pink like mine, but with no fingernail. Now that is absolutely impossible without a functioning bone marrow. You can't even um, produce skin cells without a functioning bone marrow. Five days previously, they told me there was nothing there. He was on nothing other than cannabis for five whole days. Bandage came off, they did a blood test and his bone marrow had kicked in. 
from somewhere. <laughs> um, they put it down to a miracle because there was no scientific way that this could have happened. It was absolutely impossible. I asked them, I said, you know, is there anything you've given him? And they said, he's not on anything. There's nothing, there's nothing we could have done. There's no medicine that we can give that can kickstart a bone marrow that's not there. Okay. <laughs> so I had to make sure, I knew that I had a very small window of opportunity to find out whether or not this was the cancer or not, the cannabis or not. So I took the cannabis away and I watched his blood count half. And I gave it back and it doubled. I took it away and it halved. And I did that for six blood tests and I saw this. So I knew for a fact, I knew that the cannabis had had some amazing, you know, incredible effect on his immune system and his, and his bone marrow. And so that was something I never even considered, actually. You know, cancer, yes, I'd read about, you know, to chill you out, pain, I'd read about, but his immune system, I'd never heard of this. So um, obviously I couldn't say anything to the doctors. I was absolutely terrified. He was only 14 at the time. And I thought, if they find out what I've done, they're, they're going to take him. You. Yeah, they're going to take him away. Um, not only are they going to take him away and put him into care, but they're going to then take away the one thing that had now worked for him after everything else had failed him. And that to me would be a death sentence. So I had to keep very quiet, um, which I did for a couple of years until Darren got to 17, almost 18, when I actually felt he was becoming an adult. Um, so less, there was less fear there from social services. And so I came out with my book with the full story, went on national TV in England and went, this is what I did. Um, and it's been absolutely crazy ever since. But what I have seen ever since that, his recovery is actually far more miraculous than just the initial bone marrow kicking in. So the hand that he should never be able to use. Now, um, when I came back from Spain with him and I managed to get him on some oil, because for yeah. anyone who knows uh, uh, If you don't tell everybody how he was when you went to Spain, they're not going to get an idea of when I came back from Spain. Yeah, like, yeah, it was, exactly. Uh, you know what I mean? It's yeah. Like, it wasn't I mean, the thing, same when he came back from Spain. Yeah, I mean, before we, went, before we went to Spain, Darren actually, things got predominantly worse after he left the hospice, actually, because, because he didn't die, but because he was still feeling so rough and recovery was insurmountable as far as he could see. You know, he just wanted an end of this. And they were now prodding and poking and looking at him again. And... And um, so he actually tried to kill himself for about six months. He was incredibly depressed. He just, he couldn't see recovery anywhere. And so I took laces off him. I took his belts away. I, I watched him continuously on 24 hours. I didn't let him leave my sight. I was absolutely terrified that I was going to find him hanging somewhere. And, and I couldn't get him, I couldn't get him to turn his mental health around and the cannabis I was giving him clearly wasn't the right strain because it wasn't doing anything for his mental health. So um, I had a friend in Spain who said, look, I've got oil, come out, come, I, maybe I, we can help, you know, get his appetite up and, and, and change his mind and things like this. So I begged the hospital because the hospital was saying to me, if he doesn't eat soon, we're going to section him, we're going to sedate him and we're going to force feed him and we're going to treat him like an anorexic. And I said, can we not just have some mental health care? And they said, he doesn't qualify. He, hadn't, he, he didn't qualify. So I said, okay, let me take him to Spain. And if I come back from Spain and he's still the same, I'll sign him over to you. I don't really have much choice. So he went to Spain, got him on a little bit of oil. And that first day he ate for 12 hours <laughs> and he ate for 12 hours the next day and the next day and the next day. And it cost me a fortune, but um, <laughs> he... Uh, and he chose pistachio nuts as well, which was really annoying because for 12 hours a day, all you can hear is <laughs> <laughs> But you know he's eating, so it's good. And um, so after, after the 10, 12 days in Spain, we came back and his doctor took me to one side and said, oh my God, you know, he doesn't want to die anymore. And I said, no, I know. And she said, and he doesn't, you know, he, he's, he's eating and he's well and his mental health has improved I said yeah I know and she said and he's put on four kilos I said yeah I know and she said the holiday did in the world of good I said yes it was the holiday we'll, we'll leave it at that it was the holiday <laughs> we won't say anymore um, but two weeks after we came back from Spain quickly going back to his hand um, he started telling me every day he was on oil then after that every single day he's been on oil for the last six and a half years and and I said um, 
he said to me, mum, my hand's hurting me. He said, I'm getting it's like electric shocks going down my fingers. And I was like, don't be ridiculous. You can't feel your hand. You can't, there's no way in the world you can feel your hand. They set your nerves, you know. They actually cauterized the nerves. So there was no way that they could grow back. And, um, <clears throat> and I said, you can't, be, you can't be feeling your hands. And he said, mum, I'm telling you. <laughs> and now I've looked into it. And it's neurogenesis. It regrows neural pathways around damaged areas. And so actually what was happening was the, the, you know, the nerves were regrowing. Now he has full range of movement in his hands and really it's very fingertips he can't feel. But other than that, he can roll great joints. So you know, it's, it's, it works. And um, he's got other things that the, the doctor told me he had avascular necrosis in his right femur, which is necrotic bone from over steroid use. And they told me he needed a knee replacement. There is no scientific way that you can regrow dead bone. There is nothing we can do to help. He's gonna need a knee replacement. They called me in about a year ago and said, uh, I believe you're under the impression that Darren had avascular necrosis. And I said, oh, are you going to tell me it's gone? And he said, well, this is impossible. And I said, are you telling me it's gone? And he said, yes, it's gone. And he said, but this, this, this can't be possible. He said, because none of my other, I've never seen this in any of my other patients. And I said, none of your other patients are on cannabis. You know, you need to listen to me. And his doctor literally put his fingers in his ears and said, you know, I don't, I don't want to know. So, no, but you know that our body is totally different. Yeah. Every cell of our body is renewed on a yearly basis. And some part uh, every few months, it's mm -hmm. not the same. We are not the same year to year, That's totally it. from like deep down. So, yeah, you can do shit like that. Yeah. It's like yeah. there is that power in us to, uh, to do miracles. That's it. Just because they don't know doesn't mean it's not possible. And that and that's the, the one thing that I try and um, like say to people, I really hit home. And it's like, just because they say there's nothing else doesn't mean there's nothing else. I've seen it hundreds of times since now, because as you know, I now help people who come to me and, and, I, and I give them illegal oils and I give them CBD and I help them like dose themselves and, and, and guide them through their journey to self-sustainability eventually. And so I've seen it with my own eyes, with hundreds of people, with hundreds of illnesses that I never had an idea about, you know? It's ama it, cannabis amazes me every single day. And it's beautiful. <laughs> this is, we have been lucky here in America because there is Sanjay Gupta, mm -hmm. who is the most respected uh, doctor, basically, there is in America by every uh, every level of the of the society and when he came back to apologize for having say stuff about uh, cannabis without having actually checked like uh, a scientist uh, did he did three documentary wow. and this changed everything it's yeah. like when you have when you have the top of the medicine that is showing fact uh, it's it's accepted at a uh, at a deeper level, you know. What yes, I mean? yes. It the takes um, it it often takes a doctor or somebody like that to 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 tell somebody something for them to believe it. And I think that comes from, you know, the fact that that's how we've been conditioned. And we from you know these past few generations, the last hundred so years, when it's been everything pharmaceutical. Um, we are conditioned to go to our doctors and hand over our whole lives and say, please save me. And, um, you know, it, we, we give over everything. And, and when, so when a doctor tells us, we believe it because that's what we're programmed to do. And, but I think the times are changing. Um, I think people are waking up. They're seeing it for themselves. They're seeing things like I saw. I wouldn't have believed any of this. If you'd have told me pre this, I would have, oh yeah, you know, it's, of course it is. It's, 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 you know, you just you're just a pothead and you want to get high. And I was the same. I, I felt very much the same. And but once you have your eyes open to it and you see it with your own eyes, it's very hard to disbelieve what cannabis can truly do. You know, I don't think we have a clue what cannabis is truly capable of. I mean, that's that's why Denis Perron has to be so. Uh, so respected because he brought back awareness about the mm -hmm. medicinal aspect of the of the plant that we had lost in uh, in 50 years you know yeah. I mean? it's uh, it's crazy how fast you can lose knowledge 
Oh, absolutely. Uh, Shuts the generations and it's gone. And now we're dealing with something that is that is the future of medicine. We have actually a system in our body that rule well-beingness to a yeah. level that is unreal. And if you're a doctor and you're not at least have uh, an interest, like the, the minimum interest into mm -hmm. it, it's like, are you really a doctor when you, you yeah. use totally to uh, to accept a reality because yeah. it, it, it goes to that level. You know what I mean? Your doctor literally didn't want to believe what he was seeing. Yeah. If you had told him that he was using his old medicine, he would have called that a miracle. Oh, yeah. Okay? Absolutely. And yeah. pat his own back like uh, yeah. there is no tomorrow. But yeah. if you tell him, no, the kid didn't, my kid didn't take the medicine, he took cannabis, it's yeah. not possible. Yeah. And I asked, there I is a lockdown. It's like, what? Your doctor, your life is dedicated to learn more and more. Yeah. You're facing a miracle. You're just saying that it's a miracle two seconds ago. But just because I've said the word cannabis, that's it. It's, uh, it's not a miracle anymore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It was crazy. I, I will never forget, you know, when I, I, um, I, put, I, I sat there and I put my book on the table and I said to the doctor, you know, we're going to have a conversation about this now. I said, because I'm no longer scared and, and I'm able, we were going to talk about this. And he actually, you know, he physically put his fingers in his ears and said, I don't want to know. I tow the party line. And I said to him, I said, you've got 60 odd people out there who, if my son would benefit from this in so many ways, the recovery, the treatment, all you know cannabis could have dealt with all of this and and i said you know if there's 60 patients out there that can benefit you don't want to know i said you're not a doctor you're a butcher you, you you're just a drug dealer you're a pusher yeah. you, you you know you you if you're a doctor you're in it because you you want to help and you want to care and and um you know and i couldn't understand i really couldn't understand that mentality i just couldn't get my head around it um some of darren's other doctors his um pediatric oncologists who he doesn't, he doesn't deal with anymore because obviously he's not a child. Um, they have since come to me and said, you know, I've been looking into things, you know, with cannabis and things. And I go, good, and keep doing it. Please keep learning. Keep learning. Because we, none of this needed to happen with Derren. You know, none of it needed. If he was given, if he was given cannabis right at the first diagnosis of, of acute lymphoblastic leukemia, along with information about how to change his diet so that he, you know, he didn't get cancer in the first place, None of it would have happened. But of course, we know how much money would have been have, have lost by the pharmaceutical companies if, if that hadn't have occurred. But I do want to actually thank you before I forget. When, I, um, when we met up last year at Product Earth and you, we had a word about the, uh, the word medicine. And I haven't used the word medical cannabis since then. I now, or medicine, I say therapeutic because you it's are absolutely really, right. Because, it, because it, uh, I mean, because we cannot, we cannot use the word because of the big pharma. And uh, they're playing on it, and we're playing in their backyard. We yep. just don't they take the medicinal aspect. Maybe you do something good out of it. You know what I mean? The, the plant, every plant has got a, a specific amount of terpene and cannabinoid. This you cannot duplicate, especially yep. the terpene profile. Uh, there, is, uh, there is terpene you can't quantify. So mm -hmm. you cannot really mimic it. You can take the compound, separate them, and use them according to symptoms and dose. Yeah. And that may be the future of Western medicine. But the power of the plant that we use, mm -hmm. that is therapeutic. That's all right. Like uh, yes. lavender, like camomile. Exactly. Like, Even you know I mean? primrose. You don't, you don't believe in the entourage effect. Fine, okay. We take the plant, we take the compound, and uh, we can live together. I mean, it's like Western world is weird because like, when you live in Asia, uh, acupuncture, herbal medicine, uh, Ayurvedic medicine, all that is mm -hmm. legal medicine. It's real. Yeah. So it's it's a bit weird to be in the Western world and to have that uh, that scientific yeah. block about it. It has to be a pill. 
for it to work. Yeah, yeah, the, and the it's, it's the same. Years. Yeah, and and it's the same when they brought out the new laws in this country in November two thousand and eighteen, and they said, you know, we've now got another cannabis-based medicine for epilepsy and. But in order to qualify for that, you have to go down every other avenue. You have to exhaust every other avenue before they will allow you to have it, which includes, in the case of epileptic children, brain surgery. And I've said to a doctor, I was like, why are we using the most harmful things first? Why are we cutting, burning and poisoning people first? Why aren't we doing the thing that has... A, a huge success rate with the least amount of harmful side effects because there are some detrimental side effects to cannabis there are some uncomfortable if you have too much thc it can you know i i know myself i've been there so you know we mustn't pretend that it's absolutely harmless long term it's absolutely harmless but short term it it can it, it can upset you sometimes you know um but i think you know why why we're going in with the most the most damaging and the most harmful where where let's be honest, you know, fatality is, is some of the, the side effects of some of the drugs, many of the drugs that they give in cancer is, is death. So why are we doing that first? It, it, it absolutely boggles my brain now after being in it, you know, for so many years and, and seeing it and seeing what cannabis can do. I, I, I can't get my head around it. <laughs> Me, my, my first really example was uh, in Spain when I started to meet some French people. And I met a young guy, he must have been in his early 20s. He had the Crohn's disease since he was six years old. So like your son, he was the one, nobody else on the planet had, had it so young. Yeah. All his life from six years old to uh, his 20s, he's been in the hand of doctors, they cut him down, la la la, to the hand when he had uh, basically nothing left and he had to wait for a certain period before they could reconnect uh, the left, the parts that were left. And it, it, the window of, re, of uh, recuperation was a year to uh, a year, it's pretty good, up to two. And after three or six months or something like some incredible time, uh, his body had, uh, had developed the, everything he needed. And wow. the guy, the doctor, like the top of the top of that medicine in Europe, okay? Talking, but like, actually saying the word miracle and word like that. Uh, yeah. For 10 minutes, how incredible, la, 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 everything. And the kid for the first time got the, the balls to tell the dude, uh, Frank, look, I've not taken your medicine for the past, uh, okay? I'm smoking cannabis. And wow. That's the same. It's, like, it's not possible. Yeah. You're yeah. dying. You yeah. need to take your medicine. You know what I mean? It's like, there yeah. is like a, 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 a rideau de fer. You know, when you close the shop, you have like those big metal Oh, the big shutters. Like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, they like, don't want to know. Mind, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's it, it. cannot go through it. They block. That's Dude, it. You're the top of your medicine. Yeah. You just say the word miracle, something you have never seen, yeah. never heard. The, 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 you don't fucking ask one question. Yeah. I said that at the time. I was like, so they would rather believe it was a work of God than a plant that God put here, if you want to look at it like that. You know, it's like. The doctors, I mean, the doctors even had a meeting in London um, not long after Darren's miraculous recovery. And they had this big meeting where they all sat around talking about how this could have happened. And I, at the time, thought maybe I should go and tell them, but I, no, I couldn't. I, I couldn't. I still couldn't. I was like, it's oh, maybe. Yeah. But they all, you know, all these top doctors from around the, around the country and some that came in from other places in the world, all scratching their heads. And I'm thinking... Really? You know, is it? <laughs> uh, it's crazy. It's crazy. But they, they are so blinkered. And I think it's very, I think it was Mark Twain that said it's easier to fool a man than convince him he's been fooled. And so these doctors have invested a lot of years of their life in what they now believe to be true. And so mum comes along and says, actually, did you know your eight years of training is rubbish? And I know more than you, you know, they, 
they, their egos get very dented and, and they take it very personally. And, and so it takes a real, very a, a special doctor to be able to get back and, and actually look past all of that and go, actually, maybe I don't know everything. And actually, yeah. maybe there is something for me to learn. There is a stigma. Okay, I get it. Yeah. I get it. But at the same time, if you're a doctor, you must have studied plants. I mean, in the first book of medicine. Should do. <laughs> the first writing on surgery and stuff. The word cannabis is there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I understand that it's not part of a history book and, uh, and the, not, the average literature that we receive to be educated as a doctor also. But it's like, dude, you don't ask yourself any question whatsoever no. when, when you see a miracle. It's like, whoa, yeah. what do you yeah. need? What, do you, what really do you need to ask yourself question? Yeah. Seriously, you're that. Yeah, that's stuck in your way. So it's crazy. Mm. I mean, the doctors don't even learn about the endocannabinoid system anymore, you know? So I've spoken to a few doctors. Excuse me, um, can you tell me about the endocannabinoid system and the... What? what? And I said, hang on a minute. I said, you know, you. If, if, they, if they didn't teach you about the lymphatic system or the circulatory system or, you know, the respiratory system, we, we'd have something to say about that. But the endocannabinoid system that sits above all of them and regulates our homeostasis on a cellular level and they don't, they doctors don't think they need to learn that. It's like a mechanic not knowing what petrol is or what, <laughs> what an engine is, you know, it's like, uh, yeah. <laughs> it just makes no sense to me. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, the whole healthcare system makes no sense to me. And my light bulb moment came when Darren had, Darren had cancer for the second time. No, it was the first time. Sorry, it was the first time. And it was when his uh, tonsils turned into tumours. He had to have a PET scan because um, after they'd removed the tumours, there was some area at the back of the throat that they thought was cancerous. And it was. So he had to go for a PET scan. And um, the radiologist came to me and she said, uh, this big, she had this big metal box that she opened, like a big lead box. And I said, oh my God, what on earth is that? And she said, oh, it's a radiated glucose. She said, we're going to put it into Darren. She said, because sugar feeds cancer quicker than anything else. Without sugar, cancer cannot survive. And I said, what, like just normal sugar? And she said, well, yeah, glucose. She said, so we're going to put in the irradiated glucose. Any pre-cancer cells or little cancer cells are going to show up under the scanner because they're going to have a munch on the sugar. And I went, oh, okay. I didn't think any more of it until I went home. Now, six months previously, Darren had lost an awful lot of weight because of some of the treatment they'd given him. And they gave him, a, the dietitian on the children's oncology ward gave him a supplement called Maxigil, five kilograms of the stuff. And I gave it to him every single drop. Six months later, he got cancer again. I went home, that supplement was 100% glucose. What was a dietitian doing, giving a child with leukemia 100% glucose when glucose feeds cancer quicker than anything else. And I thought to myself, something not right here. <laughs> you know, there's, there's something amiss here that one hand of the healthcare system is feeding cancer and one hand is trying to detect it. Yet it just blew my mind. And it was that moment that I kind of started really looking into that I discovered that the dietitian's education was funded by the meat, sugar, and dairy industries, the three worst things that you can eat, <laughs> you know? And they're, they're the industries that are funding the information that our dietitians work from. It's crazy. <laughs> no, it's like you need an experience like that almost to stop trusting yeah. the uh, doctors and the medicinal uh, Western medicine in... Uh, in uh, in general it's like yeah. because we're educated to trust them yeah sure and uh, but it's not like uh, our parents uh, the doctor who take care of the whole family and uh, know the whole family and care actually about the people he's treating and stuff yeah you know yeah. what i mean it's like it's it's becoming a, it's a business like for the, like for the food industry it's oh, absolutely. business oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. And the food industries, I think the food industries and the pharmaceutical industries are in it together. You know, food, cheap food is so bad for us. And yet, you know, in order to have good food, we have to spend a lot of money on it. And so it's, it, I could go into it forever how I thought this was a big conspiracy to make money out of people. But, you know, I said to somebody the other day, they said to me, you know, well, do you really think that the pharmaceutical industry? And I said, well, look, I was in the healthcare system for six years with Darren, really in it. And I said, I, 
after what I've seen, I have racked my brains as to why everything is the way it is. And I can only come to one conclusion. That is that pharmaceuticals are there to make money out of us. And we make more money for them when we're sick. That's all I can come to, <laughs> you know, um, which I firmly believe is one of the biggest reasons why obviously cannabis is kept away from us because it works. One, it has very few detrimental side effects. So they can't give you any other drugs to counteract all those side effects. Um, and, and then obviously there's the paper, the, the fuels, the plastics, all of those people too. They're all against cannabis and cannabis is still winning. So she's... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh, when, uh, when you have a miracle happening, okay, you may not want to know about it and, uh, and block on it, but the miracle still happening, okay? Yeah. And when you have many miracles happening, well, it makes big story. Yeah. 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 And there's lots of them. I mean, that, that's really how I started looking into cannabis in the first place. It was a story of Landon, um, Sierra's, uh, Sierra's little boy, Landon, who she gave him cannabis totally illegally at the time. Um, and his story was incredible. And I followed her and other mothers, actually, from America. It was, it was mainly the American side I was looking at because they were able to now come out and talk about it. And I was watching even then um, some of those mothers getting a really hard time from members of the public saying they were disgusting for giving their children drugs. And I'm thinking, I've seen my child on ketamine. I've seen my child on fentanyl and morphine and every other mind altering. It's okay. <laughs> Cannabis is it's a plant for crying out loud, you know. And so I was watching public opinion back then. And um, I watched public opinion change over the couple of years to a point where I felt that I could go onto the TV and actually have a bit of support by the, by the members of the public. And I have, I've had nothing but love um, from members of the public who have just been like, yeah, I would have done the same thing. And, you know, if they ever arrest you, we'll come after them, you know, this kind of thing. And it's, it's uh, nice. When the, when it's the nice. mother uh, is uh, on a war path for uh, their, uh, their children, there is fucking nothing that's stopping. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Here, here, when uh, with Charlotte, Yes, in peace, baby girl. Yeah. You did so much for us. Um, yeah. When uh, Colorado legalized and was the only state that, uh, that had legal, there is a bunch of families that literally moved out of their yeah. states to be able to give the medicine to their kids. And, uh, and some people who, were, uh, who did some type of black market had, uh, had all at home. And uh, in Tennessee, I think the mom went and bought the video of her daughter uh, in, uh, with the uh, epilepsy uh, starting and the, the drop of, uh, of cannabis, the change it happened. And he said, you want to stop this? You want to stop me from, gi yeah. from giving that medicine to my daughter? Uh-uh. Yeah, Not bring it on. Million <laughs> they legalized yeah. the, the medicinal part. Happy. You have to. I mean, it's like, it's violent. It's like when, yeah. when, even when you're not a parent, when you see kids suffering, uh, it touches you at a level that, uh, that makes you at least start thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's why your doctor is even weirder than weird. You yeah. know, that like, yeah. okay, happens to, a, to an adult, but to a kid that you have followed for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah. See, yeah it's 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 crazy it's craziness um but i i think that children yeah it's a, you know we, we judge a society on how they treat their most innocent and so when we can watch children suffer like that and and we're still i mean in england at the moment we've got a few children who've been prescribed um epidiolex which is mainly just cbd to be honest there's no thc in there for their epileptic children and they are having to jump through hoops and raise money them it's costing them something like two thousand pounds a month to get this prescription but of course if they did what I do and grew it themselves and made it themselves, then they'd be criminals. But if you pay two thousand pounds, you're not a criminal anymore. So, okay, the cannabis is dangerous unless I can pay for it. If it's, it's not dangerous anymore, if I can pay the government for it, that it's you know they are they are dragging this out and they are causing a lot of suffering to a lot of people that doesn't it, it doesn't need to be like this. They're desperate. Um, yeah, they're pretty much desperate. It's like they they see the miracle happening. And, uh, and they want to own it like they do every other drug. It's like, they, dude, you're never going to own that plant. No. Nope. It's very no. simple. 
you can do whatever Western uh, compound extraction and, uh, and uh, peels that you want. Uh, the plant is going to be legal, is going to be legalized, is going to be unscheduled because it's pretty difficult to say that the plant has no aspect, uh, medicinal aspect whatsoever, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And shit, it's less addictive than sugar and coffee and definitely cigarettes, huh? Oh, yeah. Going that's through it. hard times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, um, if I had my choice, I mean, I, people say to me now, because obviously Darren, he's now 20. He lives with his girlfriend up north and he's very happy and he's, uh, he's just made his own batch of his own oil for the, and he's now self sustainable, look after himself, wow. and it's amazing. And, um, you know, people say to me now, because he smokes, and I'm like, well, he's smoking pure, clean, organic cannabis, where I know exactly where it's come from. He doesn't mix it with tobacco, and I'd much rather he did that than drink, or smoke tobacco, or do any other harmful things, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to stop him smoking. He enjoys it, and it helps him, because other different administrations of cannabis have different effects and work differently for different people. And that's the other beauty of the plant is that we can have so many different ways to take it and it has so many different effects on us and, and we can play with those and, and, and you know, really have a bespoke um, therapy for us specifically. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's like uh, your, your, your son is got, he's, got a, he's got a lot of baggage that he has <laughs> to, uh, to deal with. You know, like yeah. now that he as the power he sees future, well, he was dead. You yeah. know, I mean, it's like, there is not that many people in the world that when you lose everything, yeah. uh, they, you know the value of everything. Like when you go in jail, even, even the coffee every morning, yeah. you become <laughs> the rest of your life very, very special. Yeah. When, you, when you lose your life, literally, it's like, the value of everything must be amazingly precious for him. And you need yeah. to be able to, to deal with all that, to be able to, uh, to step into adulthood. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like, yeah. give the break. <laughs> <laughs> but cannabis has saved him again now. He's found, he's found such therapy in, in growing and, and cultivating and harvesting and then making his own know, medicines and things like that. He's, He's found such joy in that, and he absolutely loves it. And I was so pr I was so <laughs> pleased when when I just when he discovered that he loved that element too, because mm. you know he said, "Mum, the only thing is," he said, "I only have to be up there for like an hour a day." He said, "Can't I go somewhere where I can like be with plants all day?" And I was like, "Well, we might have to move you to America or something. I don't know." But he's um he's he wants to now make his he's he's got some aside to make hash. And I said, "Oh yeah, how are you going to do it?" And he said, "Well, I'm going to use the hot water bottle method and the rolling." And I was like, "It's good." <laughs> yeah. so um yeah he's very interested in extracting that seems to be his thing he's he really wants to to extract and 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 make a really good thing of that he's he's very scientific is there in any way he's very he's autistic so he's very very anal about things and um the yeah, new generation they're uh, they're very much into the science beyond which is super mm -hmm. important well he did no-till living soil for his first grow and <laughs> I mean, for, <laughs> for him, anything that is not organic is fucking poison. He knows exactly. to exactly. a level that, uh, I mean, to experience it the way he has experienced it, he, it is like uh, that as extreme as it gets. So he, uh, yeah, he would know better than, uh, than anyone that uh, no till organic is... Uh, that's it. It yeah. is our future uh, else and, uh, and uh, the else of the planet as well. Huh? Yeah, yeah. He's, he's absolutely loved it. And I, I'm so proud to see him, you know, loving cannabis. And obviously, I mean, it saved his life and stuff. But he's, he really has got a, a very close relationship with it, as have I. You know, I am so grateful for cannabis. I feel very protective over her. I feel like, you know, I have a duty now to ensure that everybody I speak to knows just how wonderful the plant is. Because, um, yeah, when you've seen what we've seen, you can't not tell everybody, you know. So how much a target are you now? Uh, <laughs> like, for, well, I'm still here. <laughs> singer, it's, it's, it's amazing to be able to say, I work in the cannabis industry. You know what I mean? It's like to be yeah. proud of uh, to have a relation with uh, with that plant 
for yeah. you even if you know better you still live with uh, the full uh, prohibition yeah. and, uh, and most of the stigma huh? Yeah, and the so, stigma. Uh, yeah, the stig. The stigma is. I mean, they're still really trying to hit home with the old reefer madness thing. But um, I was in. Uh, I went to Parliament a couple of years ago to talk. I was invited by Dr. Frank Ambrosio actually to to talk at a meeting down there, and I stood up and I in, in the middle of Parliament and I introduced Darren as illegally alive. And the chief of police sat there and said, "What do you mean? What do you mean he's illegally alive?" And I said, "Well, I'll tell you." <laughs> so I told the I told the story and I said, "Look." And this is what I do. And I said, I give people illegal cannabis oil. I said, I'm telling you now, the only way you're going to stop me doing this is A, you either arrest me or you start doing it yourself and you give the people with the powers to do it because I don't want to do this. It's not, I'm not a doctor. I don't want to be um, contacted by 20 people a day who are desperately trying to say that it's, it's really difficult. It's hard, you know. I know, and I so said, we need it again and again and yeah, again. over and over. And you. Yeah, it, it, it's, you know, I, I've oh. got a few children at the moment. There's a five-year-old I'm held with, two six-year-olds and a five-year-old, and they're all terminal, and it's like, it's, it, it takes it out of you. And I said to the chief of police, I'm not going to stop helping these people because these people are not going to stop looking if I say no. If I say no to these people, they will continue to look, and then they will get into the hands of somebody who will sell them some shit oil, who won't care where it came from and won't be able to help them any further. I said, so... I'm not going to stop doing this unless you arrest me or you do it. Because if I can help someone and I don't, I'd never be able to live with myself. So they know, they all know what I'm doing. So I, I, I feel that this, this kind of conversation and, and me being so open about it is actually um, my, my uh, safety. It's my defense because okay. I hope that if anybody, if the police did turn up and come for me, that maybe French, you'd be outside shouting, you know, and that no, lots of other people would too. I, no, I, I, they I don't want the scandal. They don't want a story like this to become big no. because they make you bigger, way bigger than you are. And yeah. you already, you're too big. You're too big for their own good. They have to give you that type of leeway because if they give you that leeway, then you empower anybody to say, okay, fuck it. Yeah. My kids need it too. Why the fuck am I uh, not? You know yeah. what I mean? And it's, yeah. uh, it starts, it's a little snowball, and then it became a, a big avalanche of legalization that is going through the, the planet. Huh? That's it. That's it started it. with a bunch of crazy fanatic uh, people that wouldn't take no for an answer. And that's that's what it. it huh? Yeah, I've always been a rebel. My parents will tell you I've always, I've always been a troublemaker. And I said to my mum not long ago, I'm glad now, look, I'm glad I'm a rebel and I, and I don't take no and I fight back and, you know, I, I push and things like that. But I think like, you know, I, I, I keep saying it, when you've seen what cannabis can do, you can't keep quiet and you can't help but share, you know, share the, the knowledge of it. And um, and this, what you're doing with this, these hash talks, I think they're absolutely wonderful. I think well done for keeping going while we're all but, locked up. And you know, it's like for me to discover that the plant was actually a medicine. Uh, I was in my mid 40s. I had been smoking since I was 17 years old. Wow. I spent almost 20 years in producing country and I didn't know the plant was a medicine. It's like, yo, that was okay. like, uh, as long as my relation with the plants who all those years Has, has been an evolution from uh, really doing the most evil to being a bad boy in an uh, Islamic country to being into a spiritual, religious uh, side with, in India. And then when it got to medicine here, it changed everything for me. It's like it became, it became much more precious and serious yeah. and uh, the need to study and yeah. that all nine yards that goes with it because I was fucked up. My, uh, I, like, I, I had exactly the type of uh, childhood that was opposite to a nurturing, the nurturing I needed. Mm. So I was pretty fucked up when I was 17. The only thing that saved me is the need to travel and to be in, uh, in foreign places and to be in the middle of nowhere. And that Zeus travel and smoking and eating ash every day and stuff made me uh, the person I, uh, I am today. You know what I mean? But yeah. it's like you're born in a society that teach you to steal and to uh, lie straight up. Yep. 
You know what yeah. I mean? It's like all my life, I lied. And I was really good at it. I realized that lying was really bad when I came to Asia and you talk to a Buddhist and lying is next to killing somebody. Literally, it's like, whoa. Yeah. I mean, this, yeah. is, uh, this is something I don't even realize when I, uh, I, when I was lying, you know, because it's, yeah. it's just what you do. You bullshit. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like, uh, it's yeah. not even storytelling. And that, that living in, in Asia and, uh, and having that, Ash that balance my life and put me in that well-beingness little bubble that kept me the sane and uh, able to really absorb and learn from uh, from my travel. It's been now. It's been now that I think of it. Yeah, it's been without it. I don't know. <laughs> I don't An know. incredible <laughs> life. Yeah, it's, it, it's funny because I, I only really discovered cannabis five years ago. You know, I didn't, or well, six years ago now. Um, I didn't, I, I dabbled with it a little bit when I was a kid, but I, I was honestly mainly down the road of the cigarettes and alcohol. You know, that's where I went like everybody else. And and so when I discovered that it was actually a medicine and it did that for my son and it, it was, oh my God. And so when I had a nervous breakdown three months after we came back from Spain, um, because everything just hit me and all of a sudden I was able to take my foot off the gas and I was obsolete and no, yeah. uh, you know, Darren didn't need me any longer. Well, what do I do? Yeah. Five years just went smash. Oh, my head. And, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I lost the plot and I ended up in the doctor's saying, I think I'm having a heart attack, you know? And she said, no, no, no. And she said, you've got PTSD and you're having a nervous breakdown and here are some pills. And I went, no, 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 it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> No, I know what I'm going to do. I went home and started, you know, consuming what Darren had and changed my life. And now I, you know, I don't take any pharmaceutical drugs. I only consume cannabis, as does Darren. He's meant to be on four for the rest of his life. He takes none. Um, and cannabis has saved my life. And it turns, it completely turns me around. The more I consumed, the spiritual aspect of it started coming through. And I started to have to really look inside myself and that journey of self-discovery and yeah it's an amazing it's an amazing drug you know for, for that too you know the introduction into psychedelics almost it is a very mild psychedelic i believe it's a, um, it's a plant of power yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah <laughs> you have enough of it <laughs> you know you got a trip no the first time i was 17 okay when all my childhood I dreamed about traveling, like all my heroes were crazy adventurers and shit. But teenagehood and stuff, I had lost it. I mean, I, uh, it was kind of childhood memory, but I, uh, I didn't have the drive to travel until I smoked my, uh, my first uh, ash joint. And I had never been as happy as when I was a child running right. wild and it's like that well-beingness, that joy, that pure joy for life. Uh, this is something that I refuse to believe that it was wrong mm -hmm. to take a plant and to feel joy. You know yeah. what I mean? And uh, I needed to go away to be able to, uh, to not feel like the because they were telling you that not only it's bad for you, but it's bad for your family and everybody yeah. that you love the most. Yeah. You're hurting yeah. everybody by doing yeah. this. It's like, that's yeah. what pushed me uh, away. But now that the new generation, they, they still, we still have to deal with the stigma, but it's not as, uh, as developed. Madame Canoli is here to let me know that we're getting close. Oh, are we coming to the end? We could just talk forever, could we, Fetty? <laughs> no, um, uh, how can we get your book? Um, how, can have... people, how can people get data in Europe? In America, I don't worry too much because there is a big network of uh, data availability and connection and stuff like that. But for mm -hmm. people in Europe, uh, if we, if you could send me some uh, some link and stuff that I would repost, 
so mm -hmm. that people have an idea how to uh, to surf the wave. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, how to find your book? Yeah, yeah. I have I have some copies here which I'm more than happy to um, to sign and send to people if they want to get in touch with me for via Instagram and and stuff like that. Please. I'm more than happy. Uh, but, no, super. Yeah. Like it's. Uh, you're so much an example of the power of a motherhood for me. Thank you. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, there is, there is, there is a film where you see a mother literally lifting a fucking truck from, the, from her kid. You yes. know what I mean? That, yeah. oh, you're the same, but uh, with cannabis, like when you, uh, you don't fucking care what <laughs> <you're doing. laughs> it takes, will be done. <laughs> <laughs> thank you i appreciate you so much i appreciate this this has been wonderful i love you so much i, I love you too, and i hope you. to come to england and see you guys very very yes well. please do well i'm hoping as soon as they let me out of this country i'm coming straight over to america and i'm coming over to the west coast this time so yeah i'm coming over that way i'm gonna come and see you if you don't come and see yeah. me first <laughs> yeah no 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 we we have a bunch of friends who would love to meet you live that would oh. uh that would we be amazing. Do a lot and uh, do a lot to, uh, together. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, you're the it's been best. beautiful. Thank you. Best. And lots of love to Madam Cannoli. <laughs> <laughs>